beat the HOA with their own rules, posted by Rakshas. I recently bought a house in a new development. I knew there was an HOA before going in, but unfortunately, due to my personal circumstances and how hard it is to find a house here in Florida, I had no choice about the matter, as much as I loathe HOAs. It's my intention to put up with their BS for two to three years, dig myself out, and move far away to a place that's never heard about HOAs. This being a new community, the builder is currently responsible for a lot of questionable decisions. One being planting a magnolia tree in the backyards of all the houses. For anyone that does not know, magnolia trees grow big, 30 to 40 feet in height is considered normal. Now, this being Florida, I didn't want such a huge tree in the yard near my house, especially during hurricane season. The builder said I would have to take it up with the HOA to replace the tree, as the area that I live in requires a tree in the backyard. Okay, no problem. I moved in and sent a request through the HOA property management website to replace the magnolia tree with the dwarf citrus tree. May as well get some fruits if I must have a tree in the backyard. They responded, no, I can only replace the tree from their approved list, conveniently attached. I scoured their list, not a single fruit in the list. I was beyond ticked. I read that list up and down, even put it through ChatGPT to see if I was missing anything. No fruit tree or plants. Okay, how about insect repellent plants? None of those either. To say I was beyond ticked is putting it mildly. I had read their CCNR before moving in, so I had an idea of what I was getting into. I stewed on it for a couple of days and I was deciding to get a shrub from their approved list when I read their CCNR one more time. I found this gem. 4.58 Florida Friendly and Drought Tolerant Plants and Landscaping Materials Notwithstanding any provision to the contrary in the governing documents, the association shall not be permitted to prohibit the use of Florida-friendly or drought-tolerant plants and landscaping materials within the community. I copied it and sent it to the property management company saying that I would like to replace the magnolia plant with a Florida-friendly plant as per the above section in the CCNR. Radio silence for a few days. I do believe I broke their petty little brains. Then, I got the notice that my request was approved. I will gleefully go rip that magnolia tree out of the yard now and plant a grapefruit tree. I have since spoken with some of my new neighbors and they have all expressed a desire to remove the magnolia tree from their yards for various reasons. I will gleefully point out the section of the CCNR that they should read. Garage door clicker stolen, HOA trying to make me cover for the replacement by Hopeful Outreacher. Okay, long one. About three months ago, the garage door of our condo broke and the HOA fixed it. Except now, the door is only capable of closing on its own without giving the ability for the residents to close manually, so no one waits for the door to actually close and drive off. Because of this change, our garage gets broken into all the time, and the shack that is next to our garage spot is usually open and all of its contents are placed all around. About two months ago, the previous board quit and couldn't find a third, so they urged everyone to volunteer. I ended up volunteering. A few weeks after being voted into the board, another break-in happened and my garage door opener was stolen. I talked to the board and we all agreed that it was a security issue to have an opener out in the wild. I told them that I could take care of things as this seemed like a small enough issue to get my feet wet. Our HOA manager kept not responding to my emails, but still kept opening emails right away, and if and when he responds, he responds in small unhelpful phrases weeks later. Our manager has a long history of doing that. I don't think she has ever replied to a single of my emails promptly. After about a month, I resigned from the board for unrelated reasons. Work was picking up and I needed the time back. It has been a month since I asked to resign and they finally officially voted me out yesterday. The manager has not been responding to my emails still, even though I have receipts that she has indeed read every single one of my emails. The board now has decided that the issue is not important and wants to charge me $500 for the replacement clicker. 
After resigning, the resident living across from me told me that they had a stalker and that someone had installed a GPS tracker on her car. It feels to me they are trying to skirt their duties as members in order to save a dime and have me deal with the door by myself, even though they were the ones who created the problem by installing a cheap garage door that does not secure the building. I also feel like the HOA manager is singling me out in this situation. In the two years that I've lived here, she has never replied to a single one of my emails, often making problems worse due to them not being resolved in time. Thoughts? Not sure what to do next. Here's some updates. You don't need to be voted out to resign. Your written resignation is enough and effective immediately or effective per a date and time specified by you in writing. Was your garage door opener stolen during one of the break-ins? Because if so, I'd ask for the paragraph in the condo and HOA documents that gives them the authority to charge the victim of the HOA's negligence for the cost to repair the damage caused by the HOA's negligence. An OP updated. It was. We took photos of the events and contacted the board member immediately. We found a wrench in our car, found the shack to be opened second time at that point, and in addition, we noticed there was an opened box next to the garage door. Man OP, if going to the HOA doesn't fix this, let's go to the cops instead. HOA story time. Entitled neighbor wants workers to unseal the road so he could get out. This is about my entitled neighbor, one of many stories. Let's call him Dan. No one in the community likes Dan. Dan unfortunately lives right across from me. A month ago, we get a message from the HOA that they will be doing an asphalt seal coat on the roads in our community. They split it into three sections, one day for each section. They said it will take about 11 and a half hours, so from 7.30 in the morning to 7 at night, so we needed to plan accordingly for the day that the work will be done. For people who need to use their cars during the road work, they needed to move their cars to a nearby street, which is less than a one minute walk. They sent several emails, mailed everyone a letter, and posted notices on everyone's door, garage door, and the common areas. Pretty impossible to notice, unless you're Dan. At about 7.45 a.m., the workers start taping off areas to get ready. 8 a.m., the tar light -like goo starts going down. These guys work fast. One machine lays down the thick liquid and the three guys come in and spread it evenly. It's quite ASMR friendly as it's like watching someone color. Anyways, it takes the workers about one hour to get to my part of the road. At about 9 a.m., I hear yelling outside. I look out the window and Dan is yelling at the workers from his garage. Dan is trying to get out and he's ticked that he can't now unless he wants that tar like goo to get on his precious truck. He starts ordering the workers to scrape off the coat so that he can leave. I have no clue if that's possible but they'd already passed Dan's house plus about 20 yards past his house. The foreman comes over to talk to Dan. The foreman tells Dan he's not going anywhere and that he was notified several times. In fact, the foreman points to the notice taped next to his garage door that Dan is standing six feet from. A notice that's been there four to five days. Dan makes excuse after excuse. He says that the HOA should have knocked on his door to let him know. More shouting occurs and Dan starts threatening to sue. The foreman doesn't care. He's doing his job. He warns Dan that if he drives on the coat, he'll be responsible for his own damages and more. Dan throws another tantrum and eventually retreats back to his home. As far as I can tell, Dan is the poster child for Mel Karens. What would you do if you lived next to a neighbor like this? Let me know. Pyramid Scheme Scammer Ends Up Paying in the End Posted by Drunken Black Belt About six or seven years ago, I was trying to enlist into the military. I ended up not joining, but that's a story for another time. At this point, I was led to believe that I was about four months away from leaving for boot camp. I was running out of savings and needing a part-time job for some spending cash while I waited around. So I did what any enterprising 20-something would do and searched Craigslist for jobs. I normally hate sales jobs, especially those based on commissions, but I figured it would be a great way to earn some extra cash short term. I found a few job listings that looked promising and I put out some applications. A few days later, I received a call from David. He was opening up a new store and needed associates. 
he liked my resume and asked if I'd be available for an interview on Friday morning. I was very upfront with him and let him know that the distance was a bit more than I normally drive for a retail job and I asked what he was offering for an hourly rate to see if it was worth the drive. He told me that they were planning on offering an hourly rate in the mid-teens along with commission. It seemed like an okay deal, so I agreed to be there Friday at 8 a.m. Friday arrives as a cold and rainy day. I wear a nice shirt and tie and drive in heavy traffic to the address David provided. I knew the area from a previous job and I eventually found the strip mall that I was looking for. However, I'm not seeing any signage for the company name that was listed. There is, however, one empty space with no signage and two people inside. Uh, okay, maybe they haven't gotten the store set up yet, no big deal. I'd arrived early, knowing how bad traffic can be in that area. While in my car, I witnessed a young lady in business casual dress remove a sign from the window stating, Retail space for rent, call 1-800-blah-blah. Okay, a little weird, but maybe it's the first day in the space. I walk in about 5 minutes early, and immediately my BS meter goes from yellow to the highest level, black watch plaid. The tables are all simple plastic folding tables, the kind college kids would buy for beer pong while on a shopping trip to Target. The walls are plastered with laminated charts featuring tons of dollar signs, smiling faces from stock photos, and an organizational chart showing an all too familiar shape. A pyramid, dang it, alright, might as well have fun for a while to wait out the traffic going home. The young lady in the dress approaches me, introducing herself as Cindy. She welcomed me to company name and asked me to have a seat. She sat at her desk, another plastic table, and pretended to go through paperwork. However, <laughs> she was really just shuffling papers around. We just get to chatting and I ask her how long she's worked for David. She says she's been his secretary for about six months and I'm gonna love it here. Eventually, a guy walks out of his back office. Early 30s, clean cut, wearing an ill-fitting suit from JCPenney's. As he's walking over, all smiles, Cindy says, Oh, Dennis, our new recruit is here. The guy stops in his tracks and gives her a cold stare. It's David, Cindy. We've been over this. He turns back to me and gives me his brightest, hard to find good help these days, smile. David sits me down and welcomes me, saying they're going to start with a group interview and has me sit down in a circle of chairs. Eventually, more people come in and sit down. David gets up and begins to thank us all for coming. He tells us about an exciting new opportunity from Cutco. He pulls out a set of knives and explains how, with his company, we can make as much money as we want, all while setting our own hours. He even pulls out a textbook, saying about how this company's revolutionary tactics have even been featured in college textbooks. He opened to a page, his hand covering parts of it, making sure we can all clearly see the words Cutco in large letters on the page. Sad to say, a lot of the other interviewees were very impressed by this. One pregnant girl seemed very excited that she could work around her pregnancy and upcoming birth. David was going on and on about how much money he's made and how hard workers will rise to the top quickly. At this point, David said he needed to take a quick phone call and gave us five minutes to have some coffee, chit chat, whatever. As he stepped away, he left his college textbook behind. Oops. <laughs> so I pick it up, find the earmarked page, and I read. As I thought, it was all about pyramid schemes, and it had Cutco as one of the largest examples. It goes on to talk about how these are essentially scams, not economically viable, and on and on. So I decide to share this with all the group. I explain how pyramid schemes work, and how they're just scamming us. They seem incredulous, so I said when David gets back, to ask them about what we need to pay to get started. That finally got everyone to realize what was going on. David walks in a few minutes later, and one of the girls in the group asks David what we need to get started. Well, all you need is your first set of knives to demonstrate. You can sell on that directly, or have them order one and keep that as your demo kit. It doesn't matter, just have to pay the startup fees for it. And that's when all heck broke loose. <laughs> One kid started to get up and tell him to go F himself, saying he's wasting our time and he's an a-hole for trying to pull this crap. The pregnant girl is crying because she thought she found a place that would allow her to work despite being pregnant. David is clearly confused and flustered and asking who told them all this. When it becomes apparent that I'm the wrench in the machine, David gets upset and starts telling me to leave. People are yelling at David, David's yelling at me, Cindy's trying to tell everyone that she never met David before today and didn't know what this BS was. Eventually, we all walk out, leaving David behind. As I'm walking to the door, 
I see, leaning against the wall, the sign that was in the window before. Retail space for rent. Call 1-800-BLAH-BLAH. As I get into my car, I dial the number. Eventually, I get through to a person and ask about the property for rent at the location of David's company. The nice lady on the phone apologized, saying that they had just leased that property out. I asked if she knew how long the lease was for, as I was really interested in that property. She said she wasn't sure that they hadn't done the official paperwork yet. They were on their way to the space to sign everything with the leaseholder in a few hours. I told her everything that had just happened to me and about David using the space for a pyramid scheme. She got extremely upset, saying that this stuff happens all the time in the industry. They'll go to sign and last minute the leaseholder will decide to opt out after using it for some fly-by-night operation. She thanked me for the info, and I thought that was the end of that. <laughs> or so I thought. A few weeks later, I received an email from David telling me how I ruined his life, about how the property management found out what was going on and weren't refunding his down payment on the space, saying he violated a clause in the paperwork that he signed to hold the property, how he knew I was the one who called because I'm a terrible human being and blah blah blah. Now, he was out thousands for the space and supplies and how he only wanted to give us jobs and help us. It was a long, very angry email with several things said about me and my mother. So I called 1-800-BLAH-BLAH again and spoke with the same lady as I did before. And she was very interested in an email from David where he essentially admitted to what he was trying to do. She said it would help them all in the legal proceedings. And don't you know, I was more than happy to send that email along to her. Her lawyer said it should be an open and shut case at that point. <laughs> I'd like to think I'm a helper. HOA Karen demands what I do on my property, but I'm not even in the HOA. Click the video on your screen so you don't miss the crazy fallout of this one, and I'll see you there.